that was indeed an old holy night. And we'll be talking about that night the next um, couple of weeks and uh, Christmas. And um, we welcome you to this service this morning as we talk about joy. And uh, we welcome those of you who are joining us online or either by recording. I think we're having trouble streaming this morning, so it will be posted later, so you'll be able to tell your family and friends that it will be on the website. And, uh, but anyway, we welcome you today as we come together to uh, worship our Lord. This afternoon, we have a scheduled event of caroling, and we'll go to some of our homebound members. We'll meet in the parking lot uh, a few minutes before 5, and then go out if it's not raining. Now, if it's raining, we've tried this in the rain before, but it's kind of miserable. And uh, so if it is raining, we will not do it. And if you want to call me to find out, yay or nay, my number is on the front of the uh, worship sheet here. So just uh, be aware of that. Uh, we do have a food distribution this Friday, uh, this Thursday. No, this Friday. No, it's Thursday, Thursday, isn't it? Yeah, we packed on Friday and we'll distribute on Thursday. So if you would like to help with that, uh, our college students have all gone home. And so we will probably need a little extra help if you are available to do that. And then uh, finally, we are aware of uh, increasing numbers in COVID. And uh, I've been in touch with Nigel Poole, and he said if they are uh, making any changes that they will put out a, uh, an announcement. And we will pass that on to you if that affects us in our meeting. And uh, just want you to be aware that we are aware and uh, we're watching. But today we come and we come to worship. A very specific reason that we gather and that is to worship, and we gather in the name of Jesus. So would you join us now as we worship? Luke 2, 10 through 11 says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The first two candles of Advent were the candles of hope and peace. Today, we light the third candle of Advent, the candle of joy. Mary could have been paralyzed with fear in her situation, but she was not afraid. She knew that God was with her. We, too, are reminded to not be afraid and discouraged because he is with us in all situations of life. Mary's reply to Elizabeth reveals the reason for the joy in her heart. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. May we have the same attitude as Mary. Pray with me. Lord God, we rejoice in you. For you are our Savior too. We are joyful about the birth of Jesus, and like Mary, may our hearts continue to be filled with your joy. Help us remember the joy of knowing you and being loved by you. In your Son's name I pray. Amen. With joy in our hearts, let's stand and sing.
Thank you so much, Cheerful Carol, for sharing your music with us. Last week's scripture passage, um, we saw Isaiah painting a picture of a kingdom where people were at peace. Uh, and we saw natural enemies coming together in harmony because the rule of that king was just and righteous. Uh, this next song we're going to sing talks about the reign of that perfect king and how it will last forever and ever. Uh, you may not know this song, but we'll ask you to sing along with us as it becomes familiar. Um, In the bleak midwinter Shall reign forevermore, forevermore. 
Jesus, would you truly reign within our hearts this day? And would you speak to us and show us how we can follow you? Amen. Good morning. Uh, this is our time for intercessory prayer. We do have a few changes. Uh, Miss Jean Motes is at uh, Phoebe Putney. Um, Miss Jeanette Avant is at home. Uh, and Michael Smith is at home. I want you to go down the list and, and think of all. I, I look at the, the home section. There's a lot of folks at our home, and we need to be praying for them. Hope that they can... Uh, you know, join in online when it's available, and um, just to uh, remember them as we go. We remember our military, our missions. You know, this time of year we get time off, and a lot of these folks don't get time off, so they're not with their family. Uh, so just remember them, and just pick out a few uh, to, to pray for, um, and we know that this is what we're asked to do. So if we'll go to, to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being here today. We just thank you for this special season for your son, Jesus, and it, all that it means to us. And, and um, But this is what you ask us to do. Pray for those that are in need, dear Lord. And, and there are so many that are hurting this time of the year, uh, whether it be physical or uh, mentally stressed and strained, dear Lord. And, and uh, our nation uh, is, is, needs prayer. Um, we pray for each one of these people that, um, uh, that their family would have faith and, and they would have faith in you and the doctors that are providing, the nurses providing services, dear Lord, and those that are home that um, aren't able to come. Hopefully they will be able to come back, dear Lord, and worship with us and, and lift their spirits at home, uh, be with our military, whether here or around the, the globe, dear Lord, that know that they... they provide tech protection for us and, and um, we just pray for their safety and their guidance um, and for our missions and dear Lord that they're um, here and, and abroad just pray for them as they um, bring people to you and, and spread the word of Jesus and we ask this in your name amen so it's time for children's sermon if everyone will come down who'd like to. And I'm going to use this spot right here. Jerry, I need a helper. Jerry, I need a helper, buddy. Come here. You don't want to hold this for me? Okay. I'll do it myself. Who's behind me? Davis over here, bud. Can't see back there. I have something that I think everybody has in their house. Tell me what this is. So I've heard several of you have more than one. Do I need to ask how many you have? Yes, yes I do. How many? Seven. Seven. Mm. Seven, that's a record. I have three of my own. So this is my big Christmas tree. And then Ella Gray, stand up here and be my helper since Jerry didn't want to. Stand up and hold that so everyone can see. That way. Okay. So this is my big Christmas tree. And so this one here is my little Christmas tree. What do you think is the most important part of the Christmas tree? There's a very important part. What's the most important part? Have a seat, Kenzie, so we can all see. No, my turn, my turn. What's the most important part? The star. I don't have a star on top of mine. I have a, I have a bow, and it's pretty, and, it, and, and if you have a star, it's real bright, but, and it's important. It's not the most important part. What's the most important part? The what, Olivia? No? The joy under it. The joy under it, like the presents? Yeah, that's what I There's presents under this one, yes. The presents are very important, not the most important part. What about the lights? Do you think the lights are most important? No. no. Yeah. The lights are my favorite part. They are very important. They are not the most important. What about the ornaments? They are very important. If you look close, these are ornaments that my little kids made. 
Like there's a Mary, there's a Mary Jesus and baby Jesus, and he's all colored. But it's still not the most important part. The most important part of this tree is hidden down at the bottom. The, uh, I heard something under the skirt. What's hidden under the skirt? The stump of the tree, or if you have a fake tree like Miss Jennifer, it's the tree stand. Did you know the tree stand is most important? Because if I don't have a tree stand, what happens to my tree? It falls down. And where are all the lights? On the ground. And where are all my precious ornaments? On the ground. But remember what I told you? See, I, I moved my tree skirt so you could see it. But see, it's kind of hidden. So do you know there's a most important part of Christmas that sometimes is hidden? Where'd my bag go? Um, sometimes we get so excited about presents and parties and wearing jammies to school and eating cookies and presents, I think I already said presents, and Santa Claus, that we forget about the most important part of Christmas, which is what? I borrowed. The baby. Baby Jesus is what's most important. That's the baby's head. You're right. Have a seat, Kenzie. So baby Jesus is what's most important. And we can't let all of those other things hide the importance of baby Jesus, just like this tree skirt hides the, the tree stand that holds it up. Okay? All right, pray with me. Thank you, God, for baby Jesus. Thank you for sending him. Thank you for this time of Christmas. And help us, please, to remember the importance of the baby. Help us to enjoy Christmas and have fun with all the festivities, but never forget the real reason of the season. In your name we pray. Amen. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 35, 1 through 10. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness would, will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come, and he will come with a vengeance, with divine retribution, and he will come to save you. Then with the, will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up upon it. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing, and everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. Jesus Christ was born today. Man and beast before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear of endless bliss. Jesus Christ was born for this. He has opened heaven's door, and we are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus 
people said amen. Amen. You know, notice the poinsettia is here, so thank you to all of you who uh, purchased them and for those of you who came up and arranged them and put them together. Uh, this Our sanctuary this time of year is always beautiful. Well, it's always beautiful anyway, but more so. And then comes January, and pfft, it's all gone. looks so plain. But there is reason for joy, even in the plain. And we're going to talk about that today. We are, as you know, looking at four truths of Advent, as represented by the four candles of the Advent wreath. So two weeks ago, we talked about hope. Last week, we talked about peace, and today we'll talk about joy. And to me, there seems to be a progression of those and the, the order. I mean, there's no set way that we have to observe them, but to me, there seems to be an order. Uh, there's hope that leads to peace, and peace that leads to joy, and joy that leads to loving and expressing that love, and and we'll talk about that love next week. But whether building on each other or whether they're independent of each other, they all grow out of faith in Jesus Christ. That's the foundation, faith. And all of these things grow out of our faith. So Advent is a period of time that includes the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. So sun, the four Sundays before Christmas. But the word itself, Advent, means the arrival or the appearing or the coming of someone or something. So we're remembering the Messiah's first Advent, Christmas. We're looking back. We're remembering his first coming, his first Advent in this world. But at the same time, we're anticipating his second advent his return to this world so don't just look back at christmas certainly we look back but don't just look back we we have to think also about what is to come and what will come when jesus comes back it won't be as a weak baby he will come in power and in glory as a reigning and victorious king and that's what we are anticipating that's what we are waiting for what we're watching for and it could be today are you watching for it so as you celebrate advent as you celebrate christmas look forward to what will be and when he comes back he will complete the redemption of all of his creation and of all those who have trusted in him as Savior. First, you have to need him as a Savior. Then you have to trust him as your Savior. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was martyred for his uh, faith um, in Nazi Germany, uh, he said this. He said, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul who know themselves to be poor and imperfect and who look forward to something greater to come. Only those can truly celebrate Advent. So last week we saw that peace begins with knowing that we're needy. We have to know it. We have to admit it because of our sin. So in order to really celebrate Christmas, we have to admit that a Savior was and is needed. Your Christmas celebration won't be complete unless you need a Savior, unless you admit that a Savior has come for you. So we've been looking at prophecies from Isaiah for the first two weeks, and I want to stay with Isaiah for this message on joy. And these passages are reminders of the depth of the meaning of Christmas. It means so much more. And these 
passages from Isaiah are reminding us about that. So as in the previous passages of Isaiah, the chapter followed a chapter of judgment. So Isaiah always follows his judgment with a message of hope. Much like Jesus, when he spoke of his death, he always spoke of his resurrection. So you can't ignore the resurrection, you can't ignore the hope, but neither can you ignore the judgment or the death from which Jesus is going to raise us. Have you ever um, wondered um, where your joy comes from? Have you ever been joyful or feeling just joyful and then somebody comes up and says something to you or something happens and it's just like your joy is zapped away? I wonder why that happens. I was thinking about joy this week in preparation for this and and I was thinking about my own joy, how it fluctuates so much. I mean, my hope is pretty steady. I know where my hope is. Peace is pretty steady, although it sags at times if I'm not abiding with God. But at times, it seems like my joy is just completely missing. And I wonder why it's so heavily influenced by circumstances. Why does joy seem to fluctuate so much? And I think it's because we can allow the flow of joy to be restricted. We, we can allow that to be restricted in us. And so as, as Isaiah is talking to us today about joy, he's giving us a glimpse of the joy that believers will experience forever because of faith in Jesus Christ. He's giving us a glimpse of what that joy will look like. A, a joy that believers, because of faith in Jesus Christ, will experience. And, and these events that he is describing to us will happen physically. They will actually happen, but they're also a metaphor for what happens to us spiritually. So Isaiah 35 gives us a picture of that everlasting joy that God's people will experience one day. Uh, we said last week that Jesus said, my peace I give you. But Jesus doesn't explicitly say that about joy. However, joy is a gift from God because it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit and only God can produce fruit. So joy is a gift from God. I did a word search on joy. And it seems like when joy is used in the Bible, it's always a response to God or a result of faith. So it's a response or a result of our faith. And so it's like we have been given a reservoir that's full of joy. And we control the outflow of that reservoir. I mean, if we have Jesus in us, and that's what we believe, that Jesus became flesh, he came, and now he dwells in us by his Holy Spirit. So if he is in us, then we have a reservoir of, of joy in our souls, and we control the outflow of that joy. So if joy is a response, then what initi initiates that response of joy? Or what is joy the result of? Well, Isaiah gives us some insight as to what eternal joy is a response to and the joy that we have right now. So joy is a response first to God's glory. Verse 1, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. 
Do you know that the glory of God changes things? It changes things. Just think back of times in the Bible when God's glory was present. Like when Moses came down from the mountain after being with God, his face was shining because he had been in the glory of God. Or when Solomon finished the temple and he brought the Ark of the Covenant in, the glory of God fell on that place and the priests and Levites, they were unable to serve because of the glory of God. Or when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured on the, the mountain, they fell on their faces because of the glory of God. God's glory overwhelms us. It changes things. Here, Isaiah describes how God's glory will change the landscape of Israel. It's desert. It's parched land. It's a true wilderness. And you go and you see mile after mile of brown, rocky hills and mountains. It's, it's complete desolation, especially in the south. Now, if you will go to Andy Cook's website, Experience Israel Now, he's got video and pictures where you can look at the Judean wilderness. And it's amazing of how desolate this place is. But one day, one day when the glory of God comes to those areas, what is barren will suddenly spring to life. Lebanon. Carmel and Sharon, these are places in the north, and they're known for their lush and beautiful gardens. They're fruitful. God's glory will transform even the harshest wilderness into a lush and beautiful garden, and it will be a recreation of Eden as God intended the world to be in the beginning. That's what God's glory will do. When Jesus comes back. Now this is also a metaphor for our soul. I mentioned that. Our soul without Jesus. Apart from Christ. Our soul is like a barren wilderness. It's desolation. But with him. What was dead. Is suddenly alive. What was fruitless. Becomes fruitful. That's what his presence in us. Does for us. And as the wilderness will rejoice greatly and shout for joy, so too will the soul who sees the glory of God. Are you looking for the glory of God in your life right now? And you do that by seeking Him, by abiding with Him, by desiring Him. And when you do, you'll find that joy is a response to God's glory in your life. It's the result of his glory in you. So find joy by seeking God. So joy is a response to God's glory. Secondly, joy is a response to God's salvation. Verse 3. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Now, why does God come with vengeance? People don't like to hear about the vengeance of God. What is it that will receive his divine retribution? Well, sin. He will take vengeance on sin. And Satan and everything connected to him, who is the father of sin. Jesus came for one purpose. He didn't come to make our lives comfortable and sweet. He came in order to die, to destroy all the effects of sin. Every effect of sin. That's why he came. And the, uh, the ultimate effect of sin is death. But Jesus came to destroy all of the effects of sin. Isaiah said, your God will come and he will come to save you. Now, Jesus was God in the flesh 
who came to save us from sin, and joy is a response to that truth. So joy overflows in our lives to the degree that we realize that Jesus has saved and is saving us. That's how joy happens in our lives as we realize what Christ has done for us. If you read my article this week, this past week, and I won't ask how many of you did, but you, you saw the foreshadowing of this truth way back in Exodus, in Exodus 3. And these are just the highlights. The Lord said, I have indeed seen, I have heard, I am concerned, so I have come down to rescue them. And then he said to Moses, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. That's exactly what God did with Jesus. He sent Jesus to bring people out of this world because he has seen our misery. He has heard. He is concerned, so he came down. God came down to save us. So don't ever think that God doesn't care about what's going on in your life. Don't think that for the first moment because He sees what's going on with you. He hears what you are crying out to Him and He's concerned. So concerned that He came in the flesh to save you from this dying world. That's how concerned He is. He came to save you out of it. And this is the heart of the Christmas story that we hear over and over in Luke 2. Listen to that in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. How many times have you heard that? And do you let it sink in, the reality of it, the truth of it, of why Jesus came? I said that joy is a response to God's glory, and we see it clearly here in Luke 2. God's glory came down, it shone around the shepherds, and they were terrified, but the angel said, don't be afraid. Why? Because the angel had good news that will cause great joy. Well, what news? That a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah. The Lord. Now, what does a Savior do? Saves people. Jesus was born to save you and me, and that's reason for joy, salvation. Well, thirdly, joy is a response to God's redemption. Salvation is the act that begins redemption. Verse 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. 
in that good news, all of your sorrow, all of your sighing will flee away one day. Those whom Jesus has saved are being redeemed. We are in the process of redemption. And that process will be completed when Jesus returns to this world to usher in his eternal kingdom. And I can't wait for it. I hope you're expecting it the same way. His eternal kingdom kingdom and on that day there will be a complete reversal of the effects of sin in this world a complete reversal and that's what Isaiah is describing in verses 5 through 10 the blind will see the deaf will hear the lame will walk and the mute will shout not only shout but shout for joy does this sound familiar the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk. That's exactly what Jesus said in reply to John the Baptist's question, are you the one to come or should we look for someone else? And Jesus said, go back and say, the blind are seeing, the lame are walking, the deaf are hearing. Because every miracle that Jesus did in the flesh was a foreshadowing of the way that things will be when he returns. Every miracle is a foreshadowing of what will be when Jesus comes back. And Isaiah said there, is, there will be a way of holiness, and that way will be for the ones that walk on that way. And that way is none other than Jesus Christ. The way of Jesus will be safe for those who trust in Him. And you need to know, that trusting humanity leads to a wilderness. But trusting God leads to paradise. If you trust humanity, if you trust this world, it will lead you to desolation. But if you trust Jesus and you walk in his way, that will lead to paradise. If that's not true, nothing in the Bible can be trusted. Because everything in the Bible from beginning to end is talking about this. That God is leading his people out of this world into his world. This way of holiness leading to heaven belongs to God. And he alone decides who walks there. We don't make that decision by majority vote or any other vote. God decides who walks there. And notice in verse 9 that only the redeemed will walk there and those the Lord has rescued will return. Well, what will they return to or what will we return to? Maybe Isaiah is pointing into the, the immediate uh, return of the exiles to Jerusalem. But ultimately, God's people will return to the state the original state of perfection as in the beginning. That's what we will return to when Jesus returns. First John 3, 2 says, But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. We will be like Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So the angels knew this. And that's why they said this is good news. They knew what was happening. And this was good news that would cause great joy for all the people. But not all the people would accept it and choose it. This good news was the reason for great joy that lasts forever. The angels knew that. Do you? Do you know this truth? That your joy can last forever and ever. See, Christmas means so much more than a sentimental holiday. And we all love the sentimental holiday and the effects of it. But Christmas means so much more than that. It means the difference between life and death. So, does that mean... 
that we should never experience sorrow as a Christian? Of course not. We all have troubles and sorrows. If we live in this world, we're going to have troubles and sorrows, but in troubles, we can also have joy. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. See, the key is in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is being in the Lord and Him in us. Joy is a response to Jesus and the result of Him being in us. So Jesus Himself is the reservoir of joy inside of us as believers. He is our joy. So here's the question. How can you have joy even in your sorrow? Well, you choose to let some of Jesus' joy out of his reservoir within you. You choose to do that. Even when all the circumstances are telling you to do just the opposite, you choose to let the joy of Jesus out of your reservoir. See, it's a reversal of what comes naturally when we have trouble we want to grumble, we want to complain, we even want to become bitter. But no, the wilderness will rejoice is what Isaiah is telling us. Everything will be reversed. Even our tendency to grumble, to complain, and be bitter right now, even in this world, is being reversed. And instead of doing all those negative things, we just let the joy of Jesus flow from us because it's in there. Most of you will uh, recognize the name Johnny Erickson Tata. And if you've seen her or heard her speak, uh, she was paralyzed years and years ago, and, and uh, she's completely paralyzed, and she, she goes around, she's speaking and writing. And she was at a women's group one day, and some of the ladies asked her, how in the world can you be so joyful? And her reply to those ladies was, it's not me that does it. She said, let me just tell you what my day is like. She said, my husband leaves at 6 o'clock. So from 6 to 7 o'clock, I am lying in bed waiting on my helper to come to get me out of bed, bathe me, brush my teeth, wash my hair, get me ready for the day, fix my food, because she cannot do anything on her own. She is totally dependent on someone else to help her. So from that time, from 6 to 7, she is lying there praying to God. And she says, I have no resources left, God. This is a miserable condi condition that I'm in. And I don't have any resources. I don't have any smiles left. But you do. Can I borrow one of yours? And by the time the helper comes in at 7, and when she walks into her room, she's greeted with a smile on Johnny's face. But it's not Johnny's smile, it's the smile of her Lord who is inside of her. So that's how you can experience joy in your trouble. Because you're letting the joy of Christ come out when your joy is not flowing but you release his joy. Johnny said, I have learned that the weaker we are, the more we need to trust God. And the more we trust God, the stronger we find him to be. And see, joy is a response to that understanding, that realization. So I ask you this morning, what is blocking your joy? Is it a diagnosis? Is it cancer? Is it heart disease? Is it, is it some sickness? Is it a wayward son or daughter or grandchild? Is it something at work? Is it something in your family? What is it that is blocking your joy? And we all have that. 
every one of us, every one of us, we have a story of something that can block our joy. You know how I know that? Because we all live in this world. And it will take it from you if you let it. So what's blocking your joy? Whatever it is, may I remind you that it is only temporary. It's only temporary. And even if it lasts for 50 or 60 or 70 years, it's only temporary. How can you compare those few years to forever? It's only temporary. As bad as it may be, it won't last because joy comes in the morning. So trust Jesus and let his joy flow from you. Remember the message of Christmas. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He came for you. He came for me. Have you accepted him? Have you acknowledged him? Are you abiding in his presence every day? I hope you are. If not, I invite you to begin it today as the Spirit leads you. Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful passage this is that reminds us of what is to come when you come back. Lord, just as real as it was when you came the first time, it will be real the second time when you come to complete what you have begun. And for that, we are thankful and we worship you and we respond with joy. And so, Lord, I pray for everyone here as we all face our own troubles and sorrow and grief. But, Lord, as you will reverse the effects of sin, Lord, would you begin reversing those effects even in the lives that we live day by day? And may people around us see the difference that Christ makes in us. And so, Lord, we pray all of this for your glory, for the sake of your name and the sake of your kingdom. Through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 213, infant, holy, infant, lowly. As you sing, would you think about what happened that first Christmas? What will happen at Jesus' second advent? And then respond joyfully. Let's stand as we sing.
if the Lord is opening your eyes and your heart, that you're seeing the glory of God, um, tell somebody about it. Come to me. Speak to me. Find someone and express that. And let us rejoice with you over um, the change that's taking place in your own heart. Father, we pray that you would take us from this place with a sense of urgency that you will indeed return, and it's sooner than we think. And Lord, would you find us ready, watching and waiting for you to make all things right. And Lord, in the meantime, help us to rejoice because of your promises. And we believe them and trust them in Jesus. Amen. God bless you.